So good afternoon, everybody. Good morning in the other part of the sea. Here is uh, our colloquia for the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalusia in Granada, Spain. And today we have the honor to present Dr. Andrea Guess, the, the newest uh, Nobel Prize in Physics 2020. And she will talk about our Galactic Center a unique laboratory for the physics and astrophysics of black holes. The formal introduction of Andrea will be, give, will be given by Dr. Isabel Marquez, which is the scientific director of the Severo Ochoa project. Isabel, hello. please. Thank you, René. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for, for attending this, uh, this talk, and most of all, thanks to Andrea Guest. Andrea Guess is a distinguished professor of physics and astronomy and Lauren Benchman and Arthur Levin chair in astrophysics. She earned her BS from MIT in 1987 and her PhD from Caltech in 1922, uh, 1992, sorry, and has been at the faculty at the University of California, Los Angeles since 1994, where she heads the Galactic Center group uh, that she founded. She serves on several leadership committees of the Kirk Observatory, which hosts the largest telescopes in the world, and the future 30-meter telescope. Uh, Professor Gass is also very committed to the communication of science to the general public and inspiring young girls um, into science. And her work can be found in many public outlets, including TED, that I strongly recommend to watch. Uh, Professor Gass is one of the world's leading experts in observational astrophysics. She's best known for her groundbreaking work on the center of our galaxy, which has led to the best evidence of, up, up to date for the existence of supermassive black holes. Up to now, she had received already numerous honors and awards, like just, for mention, uh, just to mention a few. In 2008, a MacArthur Fellowship, election to the National Academy of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Science, and the American uh, Philosophical Society. In, in 2012, the Crawford Prize in Astronomy from the Royal Swedish Academy of Science, and uh, she's the first woman to receive uh, a Crawford Prize in, in any field. In 2016, uh, she, uh, she got the Becquerian Medal from the Royal Society of London. And, um, and now, very recently, several weeks ago, the Nobel Prize uh, in 2020, when she became the fourth woman to be awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. As you know, one half of the Nobel Prize 2020 was awarded to Roger Penrose for the discovery that black hole formation is a robust prediction of the general theory of relativity. And uh, the other half jointly to Andrea Guess and Reina Gensel for the discovery of supermassive compact object, now generally recognized to be a black hole in the center of our galaxy. Her work on the orbits of stars at the center of the Milky Way has opened a new approach to studying black holes. And her group is currently focused on using this approach to understand the physics of gravity near a black hole and the role that black hole plays in the formation and evolution of galaxies. Advances in high resolution imaging technology enable guest work and her group continues to work on pushing the frontiers of these technologies forward. It's a true honor and an exceptional opportunity for us to have Professor Guess at our institute, although in virtual format. And, and we thank her enormously for accepting our invitation in the framework of the Severo Choa program at the IAA. At the end of the talk, we will have some time for a discussion that will be chaired by our colleague at the IAA, Rainer Schödel, who has collaborated with Professor Guess uh, for years. Uh, as you know all, Andrea Guess, we talk about our Galactic Center as unique laboratory for the physics and astrophysics of black holes. So thank you again, an, an, an enormous thank you, Professor Guess, and welcome. Thank you. It's a, it's a true pleasure to be sharing this work um, with this audience, as you said, because I've been collaborating with Reiner Schuttle for so many years on this topic. So the work that's been recognized is a project that has been ongoing for the last 25 years 
um, uh, with the Keck telescope. Um, and with the Keck telescope, we've been able to um, discover stars that are close enough to the center of the galaxy that can reveal, through tracking their motions, the presence um, of a supermassive black hole. And this has given us um, great evidence that these um, exotic objects truly exist in the universe and a wonderful laboratory for understanding um, the physics um, of black holes, in particular um, how gravity works near a supermassive black hole, as well as the astrophysical role that they play in the formation and evolution of galaxies. Now to begin, To begin, let's look at what gave rise to the notion that um, supermassive black holes existed. And I emphasize the word supermassive as distinct from the original case for black holes. So the original case for black holes came from um, theoretical thinking about the ultimate evolution of very massive stars in, in, in our galaxy. And it was recognized that the end product of these massive stars would become stellar mass black holes. So black holes on order of 10 times the mass of the sun. And today we have wonderful observational evidence that these stellar mass black holes exist. Now the story for the supermassive black holes um, is quite different because these were not thought of theoretically first, but rather um, their existence was hinted at from observations of very active galaxies. So active galactic nuclei or AGN for short. Um, and these um, galaxies, which are about 10% of the galaxy world, um, exhibit enormous energy. And you see this in two forms. Um, what's highlighted here in this image, which is taken at radio wavelengths, are jets of emission that are emanating out from their core. So there's tremendous amount of energy that's being powered out from the center of these galaxies. And then a central source um, that has an emission that's unlike any, any that um, stars or gas would emit. So the suggestion was that these galaxies were being powered by black holes that are a million to a billion times the mass of the sun. So this is an indirect argument. Nonetheless, it was later suggested that perhaps all galaxies harbor supermassive black holes, not just the active galactic nuclei. And that in the case of the non-active case, that these black holes are simply black holes that are not being fed. So the, ex the energy that's emitted from the, super, uh, from the active gal galactic nuclei uh, is thought to be driven by high accretion um, in, uh, right outside the event horizon of these supermassive black holes. But if we're going to suggest that all galaxies harbor supermassive black holes, um, our galaxy is certainly the best place to look because the center of our galaxy is the closest example of a center of a galaxy that we'll ever get to study. The next closest galaxy is 100 times further away. So we have the opportunity in our galaxy to <clears throat> attain far more detail than in any other galaxy. And it allows us not only to ask about the possibility of a supermassive black hole in the quiet galaxies, but to really demonstrate that these supermassive black holes exist in the universe. <clears throat> now, if we're going to, um, the most direct way that we can demonstrate the existence of a supermassive black hole um, and the approach that we've used in this experiment is to observe the motions of stars that are as close to the heart of the galaxy as possible. Um, as we know from classical uh, mechanics, the um, orbit of any um, object around a dominant central object, <clears throat> or actually the orbit of any object tells you the mass of what's inside its orbit. Um, so if we want to show that there is um, a black hole at the center of the galaxy, what we want to show is that there's some mass that um, is inside a very small volume. And ideally, you would approach the short shield radius uh, for this object. And the short shield radius, of course, just depends on mass. So the more, uh, the larger, um, the more mass of the object, the larger the short shield radius. So we're really interested in getting as close to the center of the galaxy as possible to trace these, um, the motions of stars. 
So that tells you why um, I was particularly interested in using the Keck telescopes. So the Keck telescopes opened up when I first joined the faculty at UCLA. In fact, this is why I was interested in um, joining the faculty at UCLA, which was to get access to these facilities. Um, the diameter of these telescopes, and telescopes are characterized by the diameter of the primary mirror, is um, 10 meters. And that's uh, approximately the width of a tennis court. So in principle, the larger your telescope, the finer the detail or the higher the angular resolution that one can achieve. Now for ground-based telescopes, the challenge is the Earth's atmosphere. It's great for us, it allows us to survive here on Earth, but it is a complete headache for um, astrophysical imaging of the universe. Um, and we, um, this image, uh, actually this uh, series of Im images, are images of the center of the galaxy. There's some of the first that we took and really display the, the problem. So if there were no atmosphere, the size of the five bright stars that we're seeing would be the size of the smallest structures that you're seeing dance around and would be rock solid and steady. But instead, we see something that really looks like a bug splat pattern that's, um, that's changing on a very rapid time scale. So this is caused by the turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere um, and, um, and happens in the, star, in, the, in the light's journey uh, from the center of the galaxy in the last 30 microseconds of its journey. And if you think about it, this, the light that we're capturing has been traveling to us for 26,000 years, and it's really only in, in this last 30 microseconds that a problem arises. So I've spent the last um, two decades of my career thinking, actually more than that, um, thinking about ways to uh, overcome the blurring effects of the Earth's atmosphere. And there are a lot of different techniques for achieving this. Now, of course, the, the first telescope and the future James Webb Space Telescope, you just get above it. And the reason that this, this telescope is not the one that's been used for this work is that its diameter is, the diameter of this telescope is 2.4 meters. And the power of telescopes for doing this kind of work goes as the diameter to the fourth uh, power. So uh, the diameter of Keck is a factor of four times larger. So in principle, if you can figure out how to overcome the distorting effects of the Earth's atmosphere, you get a factor of uh, more than 100 improvement in your ability to do imaging. And as you'll see, that actually offers an even larger impact on this, on this project because you get into a different regime um, of physics. So by overcome, um, and, and this project has really been one that benefits not only from the passage of time, but also the improvement in technology. So I'll, I'll share with you the, the, the wave of technology development. But this animation shows you um, that if you take a long exposure, which is where the animation starts, which is just effectively averaging that bug splat pattern, the speckle images, you see the five uh, bright stars, um, but it, they're, 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 um, they're fuzzy. And so these techniques allow you to get to the diffraction limit of these telescope, which represents a factor of um, 20 improvement in the direct angular resolution. So to begin with, when I first joined the faculty, and I have to say this is one of the things that I really appreciate about the Keck telescope, is that um, uh, they let very junior faculty muck around with the, with the instrumentation, and I'm very grateful. So the initial approach, which is uh, speckle imaging, um, only required that um, an existing instrument be modified. And it, was, and it was necessary to modify this instrument in two different ways. One is that you need the plate scale of the instrument to be much finer. Uh, so you just need to change the um, optics out front to change the plate scale. And then the um, camera electronics needed to be modified such that you could take very rapid exposures because you need to keep up with the distortion time scales that are introduced by the Earth's atmosphere. So you need to be able to take images roughly a thousand times, um, uh, uh, well, actually um, uh, 10 times a second uh, for the image. 
Okay, so um, in the beginning, um, we use this technique of speckle imaging. And speckle imaging is, a, a, is a, effectively an interferometric um, approach where you think about coherent cells in the atmosphere, and it becomes, um, you can think of every pair as, as, as if it were a Young's double slit experiment so that creates an interference pattern. And in fact, that's the way we had intended um, uh, to analyze the, the data initially, but it turned out that it was, um, um, more straightforward to begin with to just do something called shift and add. In other words, you treat each speckle as if it were a diffraction limited picture and you shift all the images um, to line up so that you get something that appears on the, on the right. So on the left, you see the speckle gram. So these are taken every tenth of a second. And on the right um, was the original shift and add. And I have to share with, um, with this audience, in particular for the students um, on the call, um, uh, that um, in fact, when we first put in this proposal, um, the telescope time all allocation actually turned it down because they didn't believe that speckle imaging or any of these high resolution imagings would work at Keck, um, and for reasons I can uh, follow up um, later. Um, but I'm, I'm very grateful to colleagues for um, loaning me a tele telescope time. And of course, that's a big loan because telescope time, um, the operational cost of this telescope are, is about 100K um, per night. So this was a huge investment in demonstrating that this technique would work. And it worked better than we could possibly imagine. So in fact, on the right, we see the original shift and add for one, in, uh, for one um, evening. And then, actually, let me show this on the next uh, here. Um, now we're seeing the speckle shift and add images, which happened for the first decade, and I'm just showing you one, one a year. And I, I have to say, I really love looking at this image because the original criticism was not only would speckle imaging not work, but we wouldn't see stars, and even if we would, we wouldn't see any motion. And you don't need any fancy computer program to, sh to, to see that these stars are simply hauling, and you can probably identify my favorite star in the universe. Its name is SO2, and it's um, it's hauling around here. So we'll come back to SO2 in a moment. Now, um, the intent at Keck had always been to ad, um, advance um, uh, more sophisticated high resolution imaging techniques, and that's um, that, uh, that of adaptive optics. So as this uh, speckle imaging experiment was going on, um, uh, there was a parallel development um, of adaptive optics. And this is a very nice animation that shows um, how adaptive optics works. So adaptive optics, um, the idea here is rather than in post-processing trying to um, remove the distorting effects of the Earth's atmosphere, um, you're going to do it in real time and hardware. And this is a technology that the astrophysics community was developing, but in fact, the military community had, um, had a big leg up because, of course, they also um, care about um, seeing through the atmosphere both up and down. So in the 90s, this technique was declassified by the military because the astronomy and astrophysics community was really catching up. And of course, they have far more money um, to, uh, to develop these things than, than our community would, uh, could possibly dream of. So there was a big step forward when this declassification happened. And then it was simply a matter of applying um, this technology to astronomy. So what we're seeing here is an animation of um, how the um, light comes through the telescope. In this case, the instruments are mounted behind the primary mirror. There are a lot of um, things that don't actually happen, like the walls of the dome disappearing in the telescope. And we're about to see the walls of the instrument um, disappearing. So um, in the first depiction here, we're seeing the way in which the light travels through the system. And the, the key piece is actually that what's known as the deformable mirror. So this is a, a, a mirror that is the, a re-imaged mirror, a, a re-imaged place of the primary mirror, and it's in the top right. So this is where the action happens. This mirror moves at a thousand hertz, so a thousand times a second. Um, and it's what allows us to um, correct the distortions that are introduced into the wavefront. So we're seeing wavefronts now coming into the, um, through the system. Uh, because of the atmosphere, they look like, um, I like to say, cringled uh, potato chips. And, um, and then the deformable mirror um, takes the opposite shape um, to what the atmosphere has imposed on the wavefront, such that they're uh, flat pancakes again, and you get the diffraction limited picture. I mean, that's in principle. So today, um, at the Galactic Center, 
um, the performance is such that you correct uh, roughly 30% of the mistake, but it still allows you to get a diffraction limited core um, uh, such that you can see the stars. Now, one of the important aspects of adaptive optics is that you need to be able to look at some bright source in order for you to know how to move your deformable mirror. So initially, the idea was to find a bright star such that you um, can tell how to move the deformable mirror, but it turns out there are very uh, a few stars that are bright enough uh, for, um, to give us sufficient um, information on such short time scales. So this technique became much more powerful when we started using lasers. So you see these two lasers. This is actually not a um, altered image. It's a long exposure image because your eye won't detect this, but this is a, um, a 30 second exposure that allows us to see the laser light. And um, what we're doing here is we're taking uh, advantage of a fluke of nature. So it turns out that um, meteorites deposit um, sodium atoms in a very thin layer of the atmosphere up at about 30, sorry, up at 90 kilometers. And because of the structure of the Earth's atmosphere, it gets trapped in a very, very thin layer compared to the height. So in four kilometer, um, in four kilometer uh, width, at 90 kilometers, there's, there's a band of sodium atoms. So what, um, what's done here is that we shine a laser that's tuned to a transition in the sodium atom, such that those sodium atoms shine um, like a bright artificial star. And it's that star that we use to correct um, the atmospheric turbulence. This was an evening when we had um, uh, telescope time on both Keck 1 and Keck 2, the two telescopes. So we, um, each telescope has its own adaptive optic system. So um, ironically, this looks like two giant laser pointers pointing to the direction of where the center of the galaxy is. Um, now, I, I meant to mention before, um, one of the um, wonderful aspects of the collaboration that I have with Reiner Shuttle and his former grad student, um, Lolly, was to actually go back to these early speckle images and to increase, um, to improve our analysis. Because you can see with adaptive optics, which is seen on the right, so this is just that small box that we were looking at before. So we track a much larger um, area of sky. So you see SO2, on the right you see SO2 much more clearly. This is just actually rocking back and forth. Um, but there are, there's a, the AO adaptive optics images are, are better in so many different aspects. But you see stars that you couldn't see before. So we're strongly motivated to improve our ability to track these stars in the first decade, rather than waiting another decade to find these, these individual stars. So that was um, a, a wonderful collaboration that has led to um, um, uh, Many, uh, many new publications because we can really increase the scientific um, utility of this earlier data set. Now, adaptive optics allows us to do many things. I mean, as I said, it improves um, the image quality, but it also, for the first time, allows us to take spectra, uh, spectra of these stars. The instruments um, that we use, um, because of course you're using the detector real estate for many, uh, for different purposes, are, have a much smaller field of view. So not only do you have to expose for longer, but you um, don't get as much of the sky. So it's much, um, it takes a lot more telescope time, but it's incredibly powerful because with these spectra, you can measure absorption lines and see their, um, um, their Doppler shifts and, and more as I'll get to. Uh, but if effectively to begin with, what we were interested in was the missing third dimension of motion. So the images allow us to measure the motion in the plane of the sky. So you get two dimensions there. And then the spectra um, opens up that third dimension that was missing for the first decade of the work. It also, for the first time, allows us to understand the astrophysical nature of the sources. And this is where, in fact, many, many, many surprises have come. Uh, in a sense, we started with a very clear question um, that we were trying to test. And in fact, I think we, well, we've not only answered that question, but we've um, raised more questions than answer um, uh, once the spectroscopy has come online. Oh yeah, so I wanted to note, I mean, there's all sorts of things to comment on this project, but I thought it would be interesting to note that um, technology has impacted this um, 
the progress in technology has impacted this project in a large number of ways, not only in the ways in which we can correct for uh, the distorting effects uh, for the Earth's atmosphere, but it also affects the, it's affected the way that we actually use these telescopes. So when we began this project uh, in the early 90s, we would actually go up to the summit, uh, up, up to 14,000 um, feet or 4,000 meters. Um, and of course, uh, I mean, that, it's a lot of fun up there. There's about a dozen telescopes. And um, so at, in those times, you would meet uh, astronomers from all over the world. Um, uh, uh, but it's, it's an interesting place to work because, in fact, your brain doesn't work very well up, up, up at that altitude. And uh, there are many funny stories about um, uh, debates that uh, we would have with a student. Actually, I'll just share. My favorite one was um, with my first grad student who's shown here um, in the blue T-shirt, which is we debated about what 128 divided by 2 was, um, just to share with you the, the degree to which the altitude can affect your ability um, to think. Um, um, after 96, it became possible to control the telescope from Waimea. Um, so this is still on the big island. So these telescopes are up in Hawaii, so um, on the big island, on Mauna Kea. Um, after 96, it became possible to control the telescope from the headquarters, which is on, in uh, Waimea. Um, and that was a huge um, advance for a number of reasons, which is um, in Waimea, there are about 100 staff that work on this facility. So it definitely improved our ability to interact with um, the staff um, of the observatory and to develop um, adaptive optics. About 10 years ago, it became possible to control the telescope from UCLA. Um, and of course, with every advance, you, you gain something and you lose something. Um, so the gain here um, was the ability to um, uh, include far more students, and in particular the undergrads, um, who you wouldn't normally have the um, uh, resources to bring out to, uh, to Hawaii, but by observing um, from campus, um, far more students can be involved in the observations. Of course, during COVID, this has um, taken the next step, which is we observe from home, something that the observatory, I think, had um, wanted to avoid, but um, I, they've done a fantastic job of making it possible for us to work even under these truly unusual um, times. Okay, so um, let's come back to that. What, what do we see? Um, so in earlier animations, we were looking at a small box. Um, this is actually a box that's even smaller. It's a fourth the real estate. And the reason we need to go even smaller is to actually see what's happening um, in this image. Um, and um, you can see why SO2 is my favorite star. It's the star that has full, as, as I'm going to comment on in a minute, uh, full orbital phase coverage with both images and spectra. So the coding that's in this animation is that if you've been seen in an image, um, you're trailed by a dashed line. So you'll notice there are some stars that just appear, and that's because adaptive optics allows us to see stars that are much fainter than the first decade. So it's not that the stars are turning on, but rather our technology, the depth of our technology uh, has improved. And then once a star is trailed by a solid line, we then have the technology or instrumentation that allows us to get the spectra, which allows us to measure the motion along our line of sight. So SO2 um, uh, really has the most power. Okay, now let's look at um, what this looks like um, in, a, in a data form rather than an animation form. So on the left is the orbit. Um, uh, where we've put ourselves in a reference frame where we think the black hole is at rest. And I'm going to emphasize this because the issue of knowing how to align 25 years of data into a common astrometric reference frame or co common coordinate system turns out to be a very subtle and tricky problem. If you told me that this is what was going to keep me up at night, well, I used to think this was a really boring topic, but in fact, it's what keep me, keeps me up at night these days. On the right, we see what, get, uh, what comes from the spectroscopy or, the, um, or what's known as the radial velocity or rather, um, um, uh, yeah, the velocity along our line of sight. And you can see the tremendous changes that have occurred over the last, um, uh, uh, well, 10 years roughly. Um, 
And in fact, um, our earliest point, um, when we first made that measurement, there were no lines that we could see. So it was only actually in retrospect that we've been able to pull out this line, because obviously you could see that that was actually a very important moment. The orbital period of the star is 16 years. Um, and that was really surprising. Oh, I should have mentioned this actually earlier on this talk, in this talk. Um, Initially, we were not thinking of orbits. Nobody was thinking of orbits because remember, people didn't even think what we could take the images. So we were really only thinking about measuring velocity on the plane of the sky, and that was radical enough. But once those first images came along, it became clear that velocities, um, which was, you know, velocity dispersion gives you a statistical measure of what's inside um, um, their orbit. It became clear that this was going to work out very well. And in fact, even when we were announcing the velocity dispersion results, people were very skeptical and had all sorts of ways to suggest that these stars could be moving at the speeds that we were seeing. So then we kept going and we saw accelerations. And once you get to accelerations, so that just the deviation from the linear motion, it was clear that the orbital periods could be as short as a decade. So with acceleration, it was clear that, um, uh, that one should continue this exper experiment, not just for three years, but until you really get the orbits. And once you get the orbits, you realize there's a whole other um, uh, uh, set of experiments that are possible that I'll get to. Okay. So in the beginning, um, when we started this experiment, it was known from um, other work, in particular the work of Charlie Towns and other, that there was 4 million times the mass of the sun inside a region that was quite large, in fact, so large that they were very, um, well, it just wasn't possible to claim that there was a black hole at the, at the time. Um, and what this experiment has done, in particular by the time you get to orbit, has shown that, um, that this mass of 4 million times the mass of the sun is, is confined to a volume that's a factor of 10,000 times smaller. And, um, and, and that corresponds to a scale of roughly the scale of our solar system. So really, this is now providing us with the best evidence to date for the existence of supermassive black holes. And there are a lot of different ways of saying this. But um, uh, if you think about density, um, which is you know, just mass divided by volume, then um, we've increased, um, you've got that factor of 10 to the seventh. And on the left here, we have a graph um, where candidate supermassive black holes were compared. And you see uh, with the red line where we've gone from the beginning of the experiment to just velocities, um, halfway up to orbits is where you were with um, acceleration, and then the orbits your way off the chart. And why this is, is interesting is that um, the solid green line shows the time scales for alternative hypothesis. Uh, uh, in other words, the survival time scale for a cluster of dark objects, which is one of the was one of the prevalent um, theories for these um, dark compact objects. But the time scale is sufficiently short now that we can rule out the possibility of a cluster of dark objects. At the beginning, when we were sort of halfway through this, the particle physicists got into the game and, and suggested that, in fact, it could be a fermion ball. So in other words, an equivalent of a, neut a, new, a neutron star, uh, so an object comp composed of only neutrons, but in this case, um, a pure fermion um, particle source, which would be much more compact. And even that, when you get to the orbits, is ruled out for the center of the galaxy. So this really provides us with the best evidence to date that supermassive black holes exist. And this is really what's being recognized um, with the Nobel Prize. I wanted to highlight that this is um, this project has been done in parallel by two independent teams, uh, my group um, with the Keck telescope, and then um, Reinhard Genzel's group um, with the, the MPE facilities. Um, and it has been incredibly um, helpful for there to have been two groups. Um, there's nothing like competition that keeps you on your toes. Um, it also um, um, reveals, um, um, well, it allows for independence of thought. Um, and approach. And so while this experiment on the one hand seems very simple because you can describe it with such simple physics, the actual measurements um, have a lot of subtleties. So having two groups that can get to the same results was uh, important for convincing the community. And I think the two groups have learned a lot from each other as we've um, sort of um, successful, successively um, in, uh, reported on our results. So sometimes they're ahead, sometimes we're ahead, sometimes it's hard to um, distinguish, um, but we've certainly 
certainly learned a lot um, from each other's work as we've gone along. Now, um, with the um, discovery of a supermassive black hole that's right in our backyard, we now have this wonderful laboratory for understanding both the physics and the astrophysics of uh, a supermassive black hole. Oh, I should comment that we've labeled it here Sagittarius A star. So that's the, uh, um, that's the name of the black hole. Uh, it was named for an unusual radio source that's very faint. And in fact, it was the nuclear physicist, uh, it, was, um, it was, we were, uh, well, I shouldn't say we, the early um, discoverers of this radio so source were trying to point out that the emission looked like not a star, like excited um, emission, an excited state. So this comes from nuclear uh, physics notation that's an excited state. So while we call it Sagay star, it's actually trying to say Sagay not a star, which is an unfortunate um, notation uh, for this star. Okay, so let's start off by looking at um, um, the astrophysical role. So when um, the discovery of the black hole, even as early um, as the velocity dispersion work was announced, actually at that time, um, it used to, people used to ask which came first, was it the black hole or the galaxy that came first? It's, it's sort of like the chicken or the egg question, which came first? And there were theories about um, both. Um, some people would say that the black hole was formed first and then the galaxy formed around it. And then there were ways of imagining that the galaxy formed first and that central concentration then led to the development of the black hole. Today, we, re we recognize that this isn't even the right question to ask or the right way to think about it. And the reason that we've arrived at that conclusion is that if we look at the mass of these supermassive black holes that are being discovered in other galaxies and compare it with the mass of the central component of the galaxy, known as the bulge, there's a very nice relationship that um, emerges. So the mass of the black hole always seems to be roughly 0.1% of the mass of the central piece. Um, the bulge is so much larger than the black hole um, uh, and um, that one assumes now that whatever gave rise to the formation of the black hole also gave rise to the galaxy. In other words, they had to form synergistically. And because this relationship seems to hold up in the early universe as well as the more recent universe, nearby universe, the assumption is that the feedback, there's a, uh, there's a feedback that keeps the growth of the black hole and the growth of the galaxy in lock sync. Now our galaxy offers us with a wonderful opportunity to, to look at that feedback or the predictions of that feedback in far more detail than we can in any other galaxy. Our galaxy is the only galaxy in which we can measure the individual um, orbits and get into uh, this region to look at this interaction, <coughs> pardon me. Now our galaxy has taught us definitely to expect the unexpected. This animation, <coughs> uh, which is running in a jerky way, not because it was programmed that way, but because of the, um, my computer. <laughs> so I apologize, this should be running smoothly. Um, We've seen so many things that we didn't pr uh, predict. In fact, almost every single prediction for what we should find around the black hole has been inconsistent with the observations, which is really one of the um, delightful things about this project is the, the number of things that um, ha have been opened up um, as a result of this project. And there are way too many um, uh, topics for me to go into. So I, I'm just gonna give you a little bit of a sense and focus on one in particular that I, I find particularly interesting. Um, now, the prediction for the old stars, stars that are roughly a billion years, is that um, those stars should have had plenty of time to interact with the, the surrounding stellar population and should, through dynamical friction, sink down to um, the center of the system where the most massive um, object in the system is. So in other words, one expects a very intense concentration of old stars near the central supermassive black hole. And in this animation, we've color-coded um, 
the, the, uh, the objects that we have orbits uh, for um, as orange stars. So you'll notice there's a, actually a dearth of, of bright old stars um, in a region where you expect an excess. And now this is a project, this is an area where Reiner and his team have done a tremendous amount of work and, and there's still a tremendous amount of debate. But what is clear for the brighter stars is that the brighter old stars is that there's an apparent dearth. So there's a little bit of a, a mystery about um, what's happened to these bright old stars. A second um, arena where there's, um, there were clear predictions were for the young stars. Um, young stars form uh, from uh, very fragile um, gas clouds, so, and I mean fragile by low density, that um, should collapse under their own self-gravity to form a star. Now near a black hole, the tidal forces are tremendous. So in fact, um, the tidal forces are such that you would expect that these gas clouds, or at least the properties of the gas clouds that we see in this environment today should be torn apart. And the densities that are needed um, to overcome this um, uh, tidal force are, are orders of magnitude larger than what we see. Now the young stars, so you, you expect no young stars because this is a region that's inhospitable to star formation. The, star for, the young stars in this animation are labeled or color-coded uh, aqua, so this green, this green color. So in fact, you'll notice that they're the um, dominant pot, part of the population that's observed, or observed um, with orbits. So that's um, what I like to call the paradox of youth. How in the world did you get star formation to happen in this region where you expect um, star formation to be suppressed? And one of the clues um, that has emerged uh, is that if you look at the orbits, and actually it's just at this angle that you can start to see them, that there's a co-alignment with many of the young stars. In other words, um, the young stars, a large fraction of young stars share um, an angu a common angular momentum direction. So, so the suggestion there is that these stars actually formed out of an accretion disk that existed when the stars were formed, but is not observable today. So that uh, suggests that in fact, our, uh, actually before I go on to this, let me just um, say one more thing here. Um, suggest that these, um, so the young stars um, were probably formed in situ, although again, um, there's still a lot more work to, uh, to be done before um, we can nail that hypothesis. The kind of star that I wanna focus on is actually the one that we didn't make predictions for, and those are the magenta objects. These are objects that are um, actually observed to be tidally distorted as they come by, so you'll, um, by the black hole. So you'll notice that many of the stars that are in close are in very eccentric orb orbits, so elongated. So that means at closest approach, uh, well, that, um, that um, the stars experience a, a furthest approach on one side that's much more distant from the black hole than at closest approach. And these are objects that at closest approach um, uh, show tidal distortion. In other words, you see a tidal tail develop and then um, you actually see them um, pass through closest approach and then become compact again. So that means there's some tidal interaction that's observable. And that means that these objects have to be at least 100 times larger than any kind of star that we predicted. Okay, so that, that created a, a, um, an interesting mystery and an important mystery because um, objects that are being tidally distorted also uh, um, introduce a tremendous amount of gas into this region that can then fall on um, to the black hole. So there was a lot of excitement when these um, objects were first discovered to see if one could um, detect the interaction um, with the central supermassive black hole. Um, and here I just thought, oh, actually, some oh, I managed to do, okay, well, we're not going to see this animated because for, I forgot to check this one. Um, but the black hole is this red thing. So this is the accre um, presumably emission that's falling, uh, coming from a very small amount of accretion just outside the event horizon. Um, and it varies all the time. You definitely see it what, now that adaptive optics has um, come online, you see this varying at very rapid time scales. So when it's varying all the time, it's really important that you have the tools for knowing if it's varying in a different way. So I just thought for the fun of it, I would mention one of the fun um, outcomes of this, and this is um, almost for Reiner's sake. So um, a colleague of both of ours, Leo Meyer, had um, uh, come to 
uh, uh, work with my group and then went to the finance industry, came back and then came back uh, and then went back to the finance uh, industry. So we had somebody who had been exposed to high, how the financial um, community deals with highly variable sources and methods for understanding whether or not a different state is emerging. Of course, of course that's really important in the financial world. And the black hole um, light curve, so the brightness is a function of time, really looks a lot like um, um, you know, tracing any, any stock price. So we had a wonderful collaboration that developed between the UCLA Business School and um, Leo to understand um, whether or not we could have a very robust statistical measure of whether or not the black hole had changed its state due to um, these objects um, that were tidally distorted um, and perhaps losing a tremendous amount of, of matter to the black hole. Uh, today, it's not clear that that has actually um, happened. So this is, um, that's a much, it's a, it's a, you really need a tremendous amount of data to, um, to demonstrate that that's happened. So there's no strong, strong evidence. Um, but what has become interesting is to think about how do you get objects that are large enough to become tidally distorted? And one of my favorite hypotheses um, that we're exploring is the idea that these stars are inflated because they were, they're the product of binary stars. So a pair of stars that um, was orbiting um, um, around itself and then orbiting as a pair around the black hole. And there are three body effects known as the kozai lidoff um, effect that can actually drive basically exchanges angular momentum between the small orbit and the large orbit, and this can drive the pair of um, stars to merge. This would definitely uh, uh, produce a mechanism to explain what's being um, uh, seen, and it actually may produce a mechanism to explain some of the other mysteries that we're seeing in the stellar population at the galactic center, as well as providing a connection to the gravitational uh, wave community, um, as this community are seeing um, stellar mass black holes that are much larger than expected, and um, they're seeing mergers that are happening at a rate that's much, um, much um, uh, higher than was predicted originally. So this is suggesting that the interaction with the central supermassive black hole at the center of galaxies can provide a mechanism that perhaps explains both what we see here as well as um, the gravitational wave sources. This all suggests that binary stars can survive in this um, unusual uh, environment. Um, and so today there's a tremendous amount of work that we're doing to pursue um, the, the population of binary stars. Um, and in fact, the, data, the existing data set can be just reanalyzed re in a slightly different way to pull out the binary star signal um, uh, in the three different ways that binary stars can be probed, both through their light curves for eclipses, through the radial velocities for radial velocity variations, and then from images um, from astrometric binaries. And today, um, all three techniques are um, uh, revealing the presence of companions that could in fact drive these mechanisms. Okay, so there's, uh, um, there's a tremendous amount more that one could say about this environment. And it's been, as I say, tremendously fun because so much um, of what's been observed has been unexpected. Now I'd like to end with um, the new probes of the physics of black holes with these, with these stars. What's, what, what became so exciting once we understood the shape of these orbits was that they could provide, um, in principle, very um, interesting probes or new probes of how gravity operates near a supermassive black hole in a way that had not been probed before. So as this um, classic um, uh, graph shows, near a supermassive black hole, um, general relativity um, predicts um, all sorts of interesting effects, including the mixing of space and time that can be probed by precise measurements of the orbits. Now you're ready to do such tests once you've seen an orbit go all the way around once. And it's essential that you have a complete orbit um, uh, because you need to know the shape of the orbit. In other words, or another way of saying this is you need to know exactly where in um, uh, space time this object is. So the first time around gives you the geometry of the orbit and the second time around allows you to start testing the predictions of Einstein's general theory of um, relativity. 
There are two tests today that are within reach, and then there is a third test that's in, um, possibly reached with the next generation of telescopes. So what I'd like to mention today are um, the, the two tests. And you can think of the two tests. The first one, the, the one that's uh, um, accessible first, is what's known as the relativistic redshift, which is a description of how the photon is affected by the curvature of space-time. In other words, the photon um, has, loses energy as it has to um, climb out of the gravitational uh, well. Um, so that's known as the gravitational um, redshift because it's losing energy. Um, the shift is not all just to the motion, but rather there's an additional shift in the wavelength solution um, that comes from this relativistic effect. The sec um, and that's best measured at closest approach. So in other words, the second time it reaches its uh, closest approach, you really have an opportunity to make that measurement. Um, that happened in 2018. For, so for a long time, we were very, we used to say we were 2018 or bust. Um, um, and then the second test that you can get to is the precession of the periaps. And this describes how the object itself is moving through space time. So recalling that the um, relativistic redshift was looking at how the photons move through space time. This is actually looking at how the object moves through space time. And what relativity um, predicts is that rather than coming back to the same place, the, or, um, the orbit should actually overshoot. So there should be prograde precession. So it's like a kid's spiral graph um, pattern. Uh, but the shift is, is very small. And in fact, it's a signal that gains strength as you come out of this um, um, second round of closest approach and become strongest once you get to the second apoapse passage. So we're kind of in the regime right now where this signal is um, emerging. Um, so this animation shows you the gravitational redshift. On the top here is the model of the Newtonian redshift. In other words, if um, this is just uh, the Doppler, classic Doppler shift. And this is the extra term that comes from the relativistic redshift. So it's about 200 kilometers per second on top of um, an amplitude of about 6,000 kilometers per second. But you can see it's happening when there's a tremendous change in the Newtonian um, shape. So you really have to nail the shape of the orbit. In fact, that's your largest source of uncertainty is the um, is not the measurements at closest approach, but rather your knowledge of the shape of the orbit. Nonetheless, on the right shows the results that came from our work. Um, um, and you can see, um, you nicely see the extra term. So if, New if Newton was right, you'd see nothing. Einstein is right, you see this dotted line. And then the green is our model um, and a one sigma um, uh, error bar, uh, and the gray is two sigma. Um, so it nicely confirms Einstein's theory of general relativity. But it is, it is the first direct test of how gravity works um, near a supermassive black hole. Now let's move on. The next probe of gravity is emerging. And here I just want to caveat that this is not ready for publication, but I just thought it would be interesting to show where, where, what we're thinking about this, what's emerging today. Um, and in fact, um, what's so interesting about this, the state of the data today, is that the orbits appear to be opening up in the opposite direction. So rather than going um, prograde, so um, you're overshooting, um, the orbits, um, the SO2 seems to have a retrograde uh, motion. And again, this is um, not ready for publication, but it's exciting early days. And I want to say it really emphasizes that the biggest issue associated with this piece of the experiment is understanding the reference frame. This, this measurement um, 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 forces you to make, uh, understand the acceleration of the star, compared to the new Newtonian orbit to, um, I mean, the signal is basically uh, on order of 20 micro arc seconds per year squared. Um, and that's non-trivial to pull out of a data set that you need to control to that level over um, 25 years, as well as over multiple instrument changes. Um, so this is why um, people get very interested and, um, I'm concerned about the reference frame because that's what's going to dictate um, this part of the work. Um, it's um, the earlier the redshift is much less sensitive to this this um, reference frame issue because it's really in the um, spectroscopic domain, and this measurement is really in the imaging domain. Okay, so I'm going to leave it there. Um, 
And then I'll just add that today we're still working on um, enhancing our technology. So today we use um, an adaptive optic system that only uses one laser. And as I said earlier, this corrects about 30% of the distortion that's, um, that's seen. Um, and that's simply because that laser guide star is at a, at a finite altitude. So if you think about just the geometry of this, the laser light is coming through a cone and your starlight is coming through your cylinder. And the larger your telescope, the more atmospheric light um, or perturbations that, that are gonna be missed. So if you wanna get um, more better correction, you need to effectively do a CAT scan on the atmosphere. Um, so to launch multiple lasers that will allow you to basically tomographically map the turbulence um, that is um, introduced um, into the beam. And this is essential if you wanna to get to this next generation of telescopes. So um, there are three telescopes in the world. It's really an exciting moment um, to get to the next generation of telescopes. This is um, where you're getting to 30 meters rather than a 10 meter class telescope. And again, you, the gain is, is the diameter of the telescope to the fourth power. So this is a, again, another huge leap in our ability to understand what's happening in this environment. Um, and this nice animation shows you um, a little bit of a sense of how these images look today, what they might look like with this new AO system, and then what the 30 meter telescope of any ilk, it doesn't really matter which one you're, you're focusing on, although it does have to have this next approach to adaptive optics, the multiple lasers. And here it's just worthwhile noticing that or commenting on Today, we're only seeing the tip of the iceberg with um, what, the kinds of stars that we see. We're, we're, I mean, we're thrilled. It has uh, enabled us to, to discover the supermassive black hole and to reveal an environment that is quite extraordinary. But it's important to recognize you really are only seeing the brightest stars in the system. So while they are unusual, it might be like trying to understand the economy by only looking at the, bright, um, the largest um, or, um, uh, exchanges and ignoring the, small, um, the smaller exchanges. So if we want to understand um, how a star like the sun um, uh, is at the center of the galaxy, we really need to get to this next level of facility. Now, I'd like to end by just um, really acknowledging um, a wonderful collaboration um, that I've had the opportunity to work with. This started off as actually a very small collaboration. I had three collaborators, my two um, collaborators at UCLA, Mark Morris and Eric Becklin here on the left, and then my first grad student, um, uh, Beth Klein. And this has now turned into um, a much larger collaboration. We have a core collaboration of about 30 people that Reiner and Lolly are part of. Um, so I really, I just, I really want to acknowledge that there are, there are a large number of people, and especially now with so many different questions coming out of um, the data sets that we collect. So in conclusion, I hope if nothing else, I've convinced you that our galaxy harbors a 4 million times the mass of the sun supermassive black hole. And this has um, radically improved um, the evidence for a supermassive black hole by a factor of um, 10 million, moving the idea of supermassive black holes from a possibility to a certainty. Um, and the fact that our galaxy, which is really an ordinary garden variety galaxy, nothing special about us, um, has one, suggests that most, if not all, um, galaxies harbor central supermassive black holes. And this has turned the center of our galaxy into a wonderful um, laboratory for understanding fundamental physics, as well as the, the astrophysical role that um, black holes play in the formation and evolution of galaxies. Thank you for your attention. With that, I'll I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Andrea. And now the talk is open uh, for questions. Just uh, Reiner will manage it, but I need to say that in the live streaming there are 200 people and they want to ask questions also. So uh, Reiner, as you want, uh, take some questions for the, for the assistants here and then I can read the questions in the chat in the live stream. Uh, as you go. Right now. So first of all, uh, this, it's a pity we cannot uh, really clap here by our Zoom, uh, it will collapse the internet, but thank you very much, Andrea, for this wonderful talk on, and for taking this time for us. And uh, yeah, Andrea has mentioned it, so, so we've been collaborating for, I think it's over, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's about 10 years. I think it's 10 years next year. 
And I've been tremendously enjoying that and then also having the, the possibility of, for example, sending students to work with Andrea and then see the environment there, like Dali, and uh, so that, that has been very valuable. So um, let's go to the question. I'm sure there's many questions. Um, there's different, so YouTube, that uh, Rene will handle the YouTube. I will render here the Zoom. Let's start with the Zoom first, please. Raise your hand or type your questions on the general chat. There is a question in the chat, in the Zoom chat, right? If you want to read it. In the Zoom chat, I don't see it. Let me see, chat. I just see a private, I don't see, I just see a message from you to everyone. Where's the chat, sorry. I do not see, it. if you have it, read it please. I don't see the message. It's not, I think it's just been sent to you. So I can read it. It's uh, Pablo Perez Gonzalez. He said, does Andrea think that we will see with the, the James Webb uh, Space Telescope, TMT or ELT, some closer objects that will help us improve measurement of the uh, supermassive black hole? So I think um, the best shot at that is with the, the next, the 30 meter class telescopes. Um, James Webb is a six meter um, telescope. Uh, so in fact, it's a smaller telescope than what, what's being used today. So if you want to get um, to a higher resolution, which is what's required to get to the shorter periods, you need to get to the higher resolution of the 30 meter telescopes, um, be it TMT, GMT, ELT. And in fact, the advantage of getting closer is also that the orbital periods become shorter. So rather than waiting a decade um, to, for things to go all the way around, um, you in principle can get um, down to things that are maybe on order of three, three to five years, um, uh, which, which is essential because of course you want to check <laughs> that what you're measuring is, is uh, due to physics as, a, as opposed to um, methodology issues. Okay, there is another part of the question which says, do they see hints of having many more stars closer to the supermassive black holes? There's definitely hints of stars um, that are fainter. And the fainter ones, um, you, uh, what happens is you just see them for um, an epoch or two, and then they become um, confused um, by the brighter stars. So it's what we're limited by today is um, source confusion your resolution, the density is sufficiently high that the brighter stars, so the density of, of, of stars increases as you go to the fainter stars, it's expected to increase as you go to the fainter stars. So these things, you just see them peek out and then disappear. And then it's, um, then you have the problem of figuring out um, who's who, um, matching up these just brief appearances. Um, with the trajectory, but you know, and then there's a whole population that you simply can't see. So today we're limited to roughly stars that are roughly 10 times the mass of the sun. And that's, that's a pretty massive star um, in terms of really understanding their orbits. So there's a huge population that one, one expects and sees hints of that um, are under, lying underneath it. Okay, Rainer? So I don't see anyone here on Zoom reading any question. Andrea, I would like to come back what you said at the beginning. I really like that when the CAC committee <laughs> rejected your first proposal. <laughs> so why did they not believe that the technique that you had already proven, I think, uh, would not work on the, on the 10 meter? Oh, because CAC's a segmented telescope. So uh -huh. I had done a lot of speckle imaging on Palomar, which is a single mirror. So for those of you who don't know, uh, uh, so the, the way that Keck got to the larger um, architecture was to, to by a segmented de design. So it's 36 hexagonal segments, um, which are 1.8 meters on a side. Um, and so you need to be able to align those segments to, you know, um, a fraction of a, a hair width. So it's, it's um, nobody had shown that Keck was a lot, could do that at that level yet. So I think that's, that was the source of skepticism. And in fact, the source of concern for doing adaptive optics with Keck. But in fact, these, the system works incredibly well. Um, and it's interesting to think about the architecture of the next generation of telescopes because um, the, 
um, you really want to think about um, what's your optimal size. So actually TMT and ELT have adopted the same segment size, which is actually half the scale of the Keck segments. So you, you might think that um, the projects would go at least um, the same or bigger, but in fact, they went smaller because it's all about how well can you polish those individual segments. I know the numbers off of my head for TMT. So there are 492.9 meter segments. Um, so that's, that's, uh, that's an impressive number of things that you have to keep aligned. I didn't know that. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have another question on YouTube. Now I see them too. It's about the next general relativity test you're thinking of carrying out with ZJ star. I think you commented on that already towards the end of your talk. Uh, yeah, well, um, the other thing that the other test that's really interesting is to try to get to the spin of the black hole. So black holes are remarkably simple for, for their complexity. Um, they only have three properties, the mass, the charge, and the spin. So we've got the mass of this one. I don't know how we'd measure the charge. Um, but the spin actually imprints on the orbits, but it's a signal that's um, harder to measure. So in a sense, the redshift is the easiest of these relativistic um, tests. Next is the precession of the periapse. And then the spin is a higher order on the precession. So um, you really need to get to those stars that are um, deeper in the potential to um, have a chance at measuring the spin through these, these orbits. So that's, that's certainly one of the things that we're targeting. Um, and of course, there are different approaches today um, for people going after the spin. I mean, one of which is the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, so this is one of the original um, ideas about testing um, um, GR um, with the Event Horizon Telescope. Um, but the interesting thing about that project is that you actually need the mass and distance to the black hole from the orbital experiment. So you need to measure it precisely enough such that that experiment then can reveal um, a different approach to understanding how gravity works. Thank you very much. Here is a question uh, whether you can give some tentative hint on the future of SO2 as it keeps orbiting the black hole and whether it may ever escape by some disturbance, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to ask. Um, um, I guess to answer that question, um, one expects um, that a star will fall into the black hole or get disrupted by the black hole and, and then fall in. Um, no sé cómo quitar. Um, Sorry. Um, uh, once every 10,000 years. So in fact, this all these stars um, are expected to be pretty undisturbed, um, especially at this uh, at this level. Um, at the level of TMT or ELT or GMT, one might start to see the perturbations um, of, uh, for the stars um, that are fainter. So it's again, something that we expect to see, but I think um, it would be very surprising to see a star like SO2 alter its path over its lifetime. We right. have one, sorry? You have, a, you have a one rising hand here. Yeah, so I have two. Okay, several, one, several questions now. We have a quick, quick question maybe. Okay, on, on YouTube, the last one on YouTube, then we go to the Zoom question that are popping in now uh, about whether you have any information about whether Event Horizon Telescope will come up with an image for such a star. Hmm. So um, that's a super interesting question. I, um, so I don't have any insider knowledge, but I can comment on why um, our galaxy is harder to image than M87. So M87 is the beautiful ring that we've seen um, around the black hole uh, in, um, from the Event Horizon Telescope. So that black hole is um, about an order of magnitude more massive. So um, that means that the orbital time scale right outside the Event Horizon is longer. Um, because the more massive, the larger the event horizon. So in fact, the longer the, the, the changes, the, uh, for changes in the emission right outside the event horizon. 
um, for of the event horizon to work, which is basically taking telescopes from around the world, it's making an image. I mean, it's, a, it, it's all, also an in, interferometric um, technique. Um, you need the object not to change significantly over the time scale of the, on, on the rotation of the Earth so that you can combine the individual baselines. So the challenge with our galaxy is that the timescales are shorter than that. That's what makes our galaxy more challenging than M87. So M87 looks pretty static on the timescale of the Earth's rotation because it's a more massive black hole. Um, so um, I know they're working hard, uh, so I suspect we'll see something uh, from them on, um, on the Galactic Center, but it's a much more complicated imaging problem than M87 for that reason. So we have a quick question from René himself, and then we have Paco Najarro coming up. Well, not, me, not me, they make the question. Okay, like, oh. okay then, let's, then let's go to Paco Najarro. Can you maybe give him the voice, René? Yeah. yeah. Hi, Andrea. Really nice hey, talk. Hey, congrats for the prize. Uh, let's go back to your favorite objects, these binaries, uh, and S2. How would everything change if S2 was a very compact binary? And because we know massive stars, are at least 60%, if not even more, are binaries. Would the results change something if this uh, object was a very compact binary? We know it's not till a certain range, but what if it was? So I'm going to, uh, there are a couple of things to say about this issue of the relationship to SO2 and this idea of merger products. So one interesting idea is what if SO2 is a merger product? What if SO2 is like a blue straggler? Because in fact, there seems to, in this region where SO2 lives, there seems to be, um, it's, an it's a slightly unusual population. So one thing I've wondered is, can you explain this cluster of stars um, as merger remnants? So are the, these, um, what we call G stars, or the tidally interacting sources, um, will they ultimately um, relax to look like um, SO2 and friends? That's not what you asked, I realize, but it is an int it's like the, it's the next thing, because if SO2 were a binary, then it would be driven to merge by the black hole through the Kozai-Lidov um, effect. Yeah, indeed, it, it looks like a, a bit more uh, bri a brighter source than the typical B dwarfs around. So that's and, and the other thing that I've always, actually, I've always wanted to, I mean, I know we've talked about this earlier, which is it has, um, it's, it, it's got helium excess. So um, it's, it doesn't... Um, um, so it has an interesting um, spectroscopic signature. So I don't know if one could say that um, a merger product would produce um, a heli um, helium enriched spectrum. Yeah, I think it's been revised and now it looks like helium could be normal. So oh, the, right. helium, sorry, sorry. Helium, the helium enhancement was on the very first spectra they took, right. but right. now it looks right. like right. a normal right. thing. Um, so uh, we did look for the possibility of binaries, which I think is what you're referring to. So it, we can r rule out um, a large swath. But there's an interesting um, outcome of um, two PhD theses that have just come out of my group. So Devin Chu looked at um, the uh, spectra of all the stars that are around SO2 through, so the spectroscopic sample, and found zero. Zero to a very high confidence. In other words, if, if um, um, if the binary population looked like the field, you can't explain the lack of observations, the lack of com companions. In other words, you have to have a, a different, uh, different population. And then Abuma Gautam used um, imaging um, data. And so the images cover, have, have multiple observations over a much wider field of view. And over the wider field, from the eclipsing point of view, it looks like the um, binary population for these massive stars. So there's something that it looks like there's a radial dependence, which again is what you would expect uh, for two mechanisms. One is this Kozai Lidov merger um, um, interaction, um, as well as um, the idea of uh, triple star exchanges, which would produce, uh, Paco, I'm talking to you, so the yeah. Um, yeah. The, uh, the hypervelocity stars. Okay, the ones that lost their companions and got trapped into yeah. the... Uh, into the so, those, uh, yeah. so those, those two papers will come out soon, but they're already in thesis projects that, have been, that were submitted at the end of the summer.
Okay, yeah, thanks a lot and congrats again. Thanks, Paco. Okay, so I know that Andrea has to leave in 50 minutes very sharp, so I promised her to let her go now. Maybe we have five more minutes for very quick questions. I would like first to call Isabel Marquez, who is the actual host here, and I want to give her a chance to say a few words or ask her a question. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andrea. I've, I've, I've loved your talk. And um, I have um, probably a crazy question. I was wondering how could be needed to apply this uh, technique to galaxies other, others than, than ours? Uh, so, um, so it's harder <laughs> because um, the orbital periods get, for the, for the same resolution, um, the orbital periods um, get longer. Um, so with the 30 meter telescope, you could start getting into the, these kinds of techniques. So you can do the game of the velocity dispersion. So the early, the earliest step of this, of this project can be done in other galaxies, but you really need to get to larger, higher angular resolution to play the same kind of, um, orbit game. Okay, thank, thank you very much. And I take the opportunity to congratulate you, of course, you. and to extend our invitation to come here, here to Granada in real. Well, I look forward to being able to do that. I know I've promised Rainer for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. That would be fantastic. So please keep that on your schedule. I would like to... Um, okay, I have to pick now. So there is one question that is not exactly science, but I think we should also um, say that. So René Alberto Ortega Minacata asks... Well, two questions. First, what type of observation would help to connect the scales of the EHT and the star orbits observations? But more importantly, I work in SciComm and public engagement. What advice would you give young women interested in science? Do you think this type of work helps make the case for science when convincing decision makers to invest in science? So it's like two politics questions about investment and about, of course, getting a better okay, balance. So let me see if I can take that in reverse because um, and then maybe you'll have to remind me what the beginning yes. was. Um, so um, I think one of the um, great opportunities of being awarded the Nobel Prize is that it highlights the science and the technology that's, that was used. Um, so in terms of convincing policymakers that this is interesting and exciting, it, I mean, I think that that, that that definitely, without a doubt, that's um, a great opportunity. So I see these things as huge, uh, it comes with a lot of responsibility and opportunity. So the responsibility is that one actually should be engaged in um, that kind of public engagement of science, um, but, but it is offering those opportunities. Um, uh, so then the second question was about young women and advice. Um, I guess the advice I, I like to give, I mean, to, and I think this advice works for everyone, is I think it's super important to find what you're interested in and passionate about. Um, all of this, you know, um, you know, basic science is hard work, so you better be passionate about it, about it because some days it's just hard work. <laughs> um, and then the other piece of advice is keep exploring because you only know, um, you know, you only know what you know. And so, um, you know, yeah, there's, I think, a piece of, I like to talk about um, thinking about life in three sections. You know, there's a section that um, we we should invest in the things that we love. A section in which we should um, invest in exploring new things so that we understand the you know perhaps a bigger picture of what's um, um, the possible the bigger picture of possibilities. And then the last piece is you know helping others um, f do that to give back so that the next generation can. Um, um, uh, find their their passions in life, um, and I think that you know that give back can ha you know can start really early on in in our in our careers. So that's my advice for for everyone. Um, I've forgotten the first one. It was scientific. No, it was about EHT. What? Oh, EHT are the scales, right? 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 Okay, so. That it's um, EHT in this experiment 
are very different, both because of the, the resolution and the wavelengths. So you're actually looking at different physical processes. So the way, to, the best way to connect these projects is actually through looking at, um, or at least the one that we found so far, um, is um, by looking at the accretion energy. So at one point, um, uh, there was a slide that showed the sort of reddish source called Sag A star. That's the emission from, um, from Sag A star. And when the object is accreting a lot, um, that makes imaging by EHT hard. So in some sense, they want to see, they want to do their imaging when Sag A star is very quiet. So the connection that we can make is do, by doing simultaneous imaging and um, probing, um, probing the accretion rate so that they know what data sets to leave out. I mean, so that's, that's the one way. And then of course, I think I mentioned the, the fact that they need um, as input the mass and, and distance to the glass. Um, to the black hole at the center of the galaxy. It's actually the ratio of those two that they need. Um, and beyond that, um, we haven't come up with ideas. So you know, if other people have thoughts, you know, I think both teams would love to hear, <laughs> to hear them. Yes. Oh, thank you, Andrea. The, are you here? Yes. The, I think two, two very fast things you need to leave. So Lali said, loves your talk. She says hi, and she would Briefly know the limit of masses of stars that one could access with the next generation of telescopes with an ELT or a TNT. Oh yeah, thanks Lali. Hi Lali, and thanks for all um, the work that we got, we got to do together. Um, the ex one of the exciting things is that you could actually get down to um, the pre-main sequence turn on um, for these young stars. Um, so that's at about, I believe at about a solar, uh, solar mass. Uh, I may have that wrong. I don't have it off the top of my head, but I'll tell you where to find it. We put this in um, Jessica's 2009 paper. There's a nice um, plot that shows exactly where you should get with the uh, um, TMT and of course the ELT should do the same. So, and I think last not least, I'm sorry for everyone who couldn't ask any question. I think Anton Alberti, who is our director, I'm not sure he's raised hands. I'm not sure whether he has a question or ask, but I would like him to give the opportunity of saying a few words because we really let you go. So you have a, have a short coffee break before your next meeting. And I have a question in fact. Okay. Hi, Andrea. Thanks a lot for your very nice talk and also congratulations for your prize. L let me ask you a question, please. Uh, with the astrometric reference frame that is available just now, when do you think that the orbital precision predicted by GR will become detectable? Um, in principle, it's detectable now. And so the issue is more having to do with systematics rather than statistical effects. So it becomes much more like a, uh, the high energy particle physics experiments where the, the, the biggest culprits are all about um, systematics. Um, so statistically now, <laughs> yeah, and uh, systematics, uh, you just have to do your, all your homework to make sure that you've, you've, you know, you've, you've done your best to, to eliminate the system. Uh, Okay, th thanks a lot. And as director of the Institute, let me insist on the invitation to come here to Granada when the, pandem when the pandemia allows to do it. Okay, thanks a lot again. Thanks so much. Okay, so I think we have to, to wrap up now because Andrea, I think, urgently needs a, a little break in her busy schedule. So Andrea, thank you very much again. Please come. You have a big dinner waiting for you in Granada. <laughs> and um, thank you very much for all of you for participating. My apology for those of you who couldn't get the questions through. Andrea, I think we got almost to 300 participants with, with about 100 yeah. via YouTube and then 200 via, no, 200 the live stream on YouTube and 100 via Zoom. No, so one, more than 100, 110 by Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I, th I saw even 150 in one moment. So, but mm -hmm. so discounting multiples, I think we had roughly 300. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone for listening in. Thanks, Andrea. Have a very good day and uh, hope to meet you in person soon again. And uh, thank after you. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you very much.